Well, good morning. Let's run that back. Uh, good morning. There we go. Okay, okay, we're here. We're good. Uh, it's nice to have you all here with us today. Uh, thanks, as always, for the worship team for leading. Um, I, someone said to me before we started this morning, you know, it's been kind of a, a burden on them to come and play twice, and sometimes I think maybe they just <laughs> really love two opportunities to play on Sundays, so I uh, appreciate that uh, from them. Um, according to usafacts.org, so that's, that's no .com website, this is .org, uh, this is good data here. Uh, according to usafacts.org, here are some stats on how people are feeling uh, in America. This is as of uh, this past June. Okay, so I got three things here. Uh, number one, about 53% of, Amer- of Americans said they experienced not being able to stop or control worrying at least several days during the past week. Number two, uh, in 2018, the last year data is available uh, for this data research group, the depression rate for the U.S. adult population was 19.6%, so approximately one in five uh, adults in the United States uh, depressed. Number three, when it comes to anxiety, 60% of American adults experienced frequency of feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge in the last seven days, so considerably over half. Um, Add to that, in case you all have been uh, hiding in a cave or under a rock somewhere, uh, are, are you aware there's an election coming up? Does anyone, anyone know that that's happening? Um, add, add that. Uh, also, this uh, COVID thing is still here and still a thing. Um, and as I was talking with somebody this morning, uh, winter is coming. Who realized winter is coming. And so I probably better stop giving you, you this data before everyone, like, you know, is reaching for tissues and there's, like, pools of tears and people are just, you know, falling over in, in tears crying. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that this story that I'm going to share with you today, uh, from 4,000 years ago, approximately, as it impacts another story from approximately 2,000 years ago, can change that reality. Like, it, it can actually change that reality, that... 4,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago can change how this current situation is uh, in our world. Um, we're in our Jesus is, is Better series, which again, think I should, should have changed the name, Jesus at the Center. Um, and you might have realized that we are in a bit of trouble. Actually, we're in a good bit of trouble. And the reason we're in a good bit of trouble is because today we're at Genesis chapter 22, There are 900, I did the research, and I actually made this graph, Uh, there are 907 chapters, uh, I'm sorry, 929 chapters in the Old Testament, and we're 22 chapters in, uh, halfway through the first book, uh, 38 and a half books uh, left to go, so we're in a bit of trouble, but I promise you we will get, uh, about Christmas time, we will get to Jesus, so just hang in there. Uh, This passage today is just entirely, entirely too good to skip over, so we're here. Um... Today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to about 14-ish. Uh, this story is what a lot of us as Christians might refer to as the sacrifice of Isaac, the sacrifice of Isaac, which is fascinating. Even in its name, uh, most Jewish folks are going to call the same story the binding of Isaac. Well, in my opinion, that sort of makes a little more sense because uh, if you know kind of how the story ends, he doesn't actually get sacrificed, or does he? And we'll kind of talk about that at the end. Uh, one other name that this will go by is the Akedah. That's another Jewish title uh, referencing this story from Genesis 22. Um, before we get into Genesis 22, the actual text, I need to give you one piece of cultural context. Okay. So uh, our friend Avram, who we uh, talked about last week, the call of Avram, and then remember the whole thing with the blood path, that same Avram we're going to see again in Genesis 22 about 10 chapters later. Uh, his name has been changed. It's now Avraham. And he lives in a time and place and a world in the ancient Near East in which child sacrifice is prevalent all over the place. Every culture, every people group, every person you run into is going to be very familiar and very uh, comfortable, religiously speaking, with this concept of child sacrifice. And the problem is, if 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 we go from 2020 in our brains and how we think about things, and we go back into Genesis 22, and we don't understand that context, we're not going to see this story the way it ought to be seen, the way those original hearers would have heard and seen how God is, is presented in the Bible in Genesis chapter 22. So it's super important that we see that child sacrifice is super prevalent at the time that this 
is happening in our story, Genesis 22. Um, I have a, a scholarly quote. This is not from a Christian person. This is just a scholar that's looking at this thing. And he, here's what he says. He says, the practice, and that's being child sacrifice, permeated ancient Near Eastern uh, religiosity throughout the Fertile Crescent. That would include all the areas where we're talking about in Israel. Um, influencing cultures across North Africa and Southern Europe, it is demonstrable in the archaeological record from as early as the prehistoric periods and is evident in the textual traditions. So that's like the Bible, but also other uh, religious textual traditions um, from the early historical areas, eras through the first millennium BCE and beyond. In other words, this idea of child sacrifice is everywhere for a very, very long t period of time. And so we've got to, got to have that mindset going in. I'm not going to have time to go over it now, and um, I don't want to do this with uh, kiddos around. Uh, but if you're interested in more of kind of what that looks like in that culture in that time, do a quick Google search of this, uh, this uh, name, Moloch, M-O-L-O-C-H or M-O-L-E-C-H, and you'll see kind of how crazy and how intense this child sacrifice situation is within the context of which we're going to come to this passage. So it's, it's really just crucial for us to have that background. Why do I bring all that stuff up? I think what we'll find in this passage is that the God of the Bible is a God who is the exception and not the norm at that kind of cultural e era. He's the exception and not the norm. And we, we're going to struggle, rightly as we should, to see how does God ask um, Abraham to sacrifice his son. We're going we're to rightly struggle with that, but we need to kind of come at that with that other cultural uh, surrounding situation so that we can see it correctly um, as the exception and not the norm. Okay, here we go. We're, we're jumping into Genesis uh, 22, starting at verse 1. Here we go. Sometime later, God tested Avraham. He said to him, Avraham, here I am, he replied. We're going we're gonna to see that sentence in a little bit, so hang on to that. Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Um, there's two things I want to say about that section uh, of this passage. The first one is, uh, if you recall back to Genesis 12, uh, the beginning of Genesis 12, verse 1, and the original call that God gave to uh, Avram at that time, who's now Avraham, uh, that sentence said something like this. The Lord said to Avram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Notice how the structure of, that, of, that, uh, of what God's asking him to do is very similar there as it is in our Genesis 22 passage. They're almost like mirrors of each other. And so what that's telling us is that for 10 chapters, God's working with Avram slash Avraham has always been, I'm going to say something, and are you going to respond to my word? I'm going to say something. Are you going to respond to my word? And kind of how's that, that going to go? Now, in, in Genesis 12, it was like, hey, Avram, you got to move. It's like, okay, that's not a huge deal. Which brings me to my second point. This is way more intense than Genesis 12. And even the structure of the question, I mean, <clears throat> just think about this. Uh, take your son. Okay, it's a kind of this generic, grab your son. Uh, oh, your only son, which... If we're following along with the story, it's actually not his only son. There's Ishmael, this other son. This is his only son with Sarah. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go and sacrifice him on the mountain. Uh, a major theme that I want to get across today is that we, we cannot lullaby this story. We cannot. We will do tremendous injustice if we lullaby this story. What do I mean by that? Do you ever hear the, uh, Lord help us all, I cannot sing, but did you ever hear the, the um, rockabye baby uh, kind of lullaby that we sing to kids? And one, one line in that is, like, when, when the bow breaks, uh, the cradle will fall, down will come cradle, baby and all. And it's like, we sing that, and it's like, oh, we're sleeping, this kid's sleep, it's cute. Like, we're, we're talking about a cradle falling out of a tree and crashing to the ground. And like, why, why are we saying that, singing that so peacefully and wonderfully to this kid? It just doesn't make sense. Like, there's a, there's a conflict there. I think we can do the same thing with this passage. We can be like, oh yeah, I heard this story in church like a thousand times. I know he's going to go sacrifice, and then there'll be something, a substitute, and it'll be fine. We've got to see it with as, as best, fresh, kind of first reading eyes as we can to really grasp the depth of this story. 
We, can, we, we cannot lullaby it, okay? Uh, in fact, I would say um, <laughs> we should wrestle with this so much that I've thought through this. Let's just say tomorrow, um, Monday, someone calls me up and says, you know, Pastor Luke, I, I have this, uh, this word that God told me. He told me to take my child and go up to the seven mountains and, and sat. Here's what I would do. I would do every single stinking thing I could do in my power to stop you from sacrificing your child. I would do everything I could and get whatever help is needed for that situation. And so we have to wrestle with the fact that this question is not like a, oh yeah, it's a Bible question, it's you know, cute stories, it's whatever. No, it's, this is like significantly deep and intense struggle that has to go on here. Okay. Um, what we have to go by is the text. And God says this to Avraham, and I assume that he had a very, very, very difficult time sleeping that night. And then we come to the next passage, and we have to, you know, we have to deal with what's, what's here, right? So it goes on. Uh, early the next morning, Avraham got up, and he loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Avraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here while the, with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Now, some commentators are going to argue that because he says, we will worship and we will come back to you, that Avraham knows all along that, you know, Isaac is not actually going to be, have to be sacrificed, and he'll come back, and everything will be fine. I'm not so convinced of that. And the reason I'm not so convinced of that is because later Isaac is going to say, you know, where's the sacrifice? And Avram's going to kind of like sort of dodge the question. I, in my sense of it, and, and this isn't, you know, perfect truth for sure, but in my sense of it, you know, if he says to them, I'm going here to kill Isaac, I'm only going to come back, that's going to erupt them. They might try to stop him. What's Isaac going to do? All that kind of stuff. So he has to wrestle with all those things. So I think that there's still this sense that he, he's not sure what's going to happen uh, up here on this mountain. And... So like I said, we have to, this, this story is inviting us in to wrestle with all these deep kind of questions. And it's, it's a really cool story because when we wrestle with deep questions, then we can come out more, more faithful and more trustworthy in the end. But if we just kind of lullaby and surface level this thing, then it's not going to change our lives at all. And so I want to encourage you to think through some of the questions this story is inviting us to, to wrestle with. So number one, what is Avraham thinking on the three-day journey from when he's first told to do this to when he actually gets to Mount Moriah. Like, what, what's going, it's not like, oh, go sacrifice your son. He grabs him and, like, up to the mountain we go and get this thing done. And every, He has three days to process this, you know, three nights to sleep. I mean, how many of us struggle with sleepless nights for, like, other things that are much less, you know, significant as this? Number two, and this is the one that really gets me, <clears throat> how is he processing what he's going to say to his wife? I mean, yeah, Sarah, remember, remember that, that, that kid of ours? You know the one that we've been waiting like 25 years, God said he was going to have a kid, then the whole Ishmael thing, but then we did really miraculous, oh, about him. By the way, God told me to go up here and sacrifice him on this mountain, so I don't, like, how does he process how to say that to his wife who was so involved in that whole story? Like, what's he thinking about that? And the third question, which is the question kind of underneath all of those questions, is how on earth does God ask this question at all? How does a loving God, you know, we can stand up here and we can sing, but this is in the Bible and, and we got to go through it. Or a better way to say this is we're not really going to trust the Bible as all correct and, and God-inspired and helpful for our lives if we can't wrestle with and trust, you know, all the parts of it. And so how could a loving God even ask this question? Um, I think we'll get to some good <laughs> answers for that. So uh, sorry, everything's like depressing so far, but just hang in with me. Um, what I'm going to do now is read basically the rest of the story. So this is kind of the rest of what happens, and then we'll make some commentary at the end of that, all right? So uh, <clears throat> Avraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife, and the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Avraham, Father... Yes, my son, Avraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Avraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. 
When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Avraham, Avraham. Here I am, he replied. Remember that same sentence? Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son, and we assume whom you love. Avraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Avraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Now, I said that we need to read this story to see that God is the exception and not the rule. Because as it turned out, he did not, he, he, he stopped Avraham and, and did not require child sacrifice like every other culture around them would have easily and comfortably done. In fact, um, what God did is he provided a substitute sacrifice in the place of Isaac. And some of your brains are going, and you're, you're already seeing where, the, where this is going to go to, right? He provided a substitute sacrifice in the place of Isaac. Um, it's interesting, uh, not 100% verified, but uh, here's what the biblical text tells us. So uh, Av- Avraham took Isaac to the area, the region of Mount Moriah. And we have uh, a, a passage, a really fascinating sentence in uh, 2 Chronicles 3, which you might say, how in the world is I never even read Chronicles. It's like, what's happening there? Uh, 2 Chronicles 3, there's a fascinating sentence that says that Solomon is going to build the temple at Mount Moriah. Okay, so this is interesting. So first we had this sacrifice story 4,000 years ago, and then King Solomon is going to build you know, the Jew- Jewish temple at Mount Moriah, and that's where sacrifices are going to happen regularly. Sacrifices, sacrifices, sacrifices. All that you read through, you know, all those kind of books in the middle, and the Levitic, all this stuff about the sacrifice, all, that whole system at Solomon's temple. Well, do we know where Solomon's temple was? Solomon's temple would have been in Jerusalem. Do we know what other sacrifice happened in Jerusalem? And you kind of see where I'm going with this. Uh, Jesus is the substitutionary sacrifice that was substituted in the same same vicinity. Now, there's some some dialogue about that, so I'm not saying that with 100% certainty, but uh, according to the biblical text here, we have Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah. Um. One of the main reasons I could not skip over this passage, hopefully you're going to see this in a second, is because there's unbelievable similarities between the story of uh, Isaac and the binding of Isaac and the sacrifice, the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Unbelievable parallels. Now, uh, because I'm not the kind of person who's going to give you every single thing and not make you guys work for some of your own stuff, I'm only going to share some of them. I'm leaving like five to seven kind of in my back pocket. So if you want to research that on your own, go for it. Um, But I'm going to go through six of these. So six similarities between what happened with Isaac in Genesis 22 and Jesus Christ. Here we go. Number one, uh, both fulfilled promises. So Isaac was the long-promised son. Remember Genesis 23, you're going to have a descendant. Remember the whole blood path. All that stuff was about having descendants and living the land. Uh, He was the long-promised descendant, about 25 years or so of uh, Avram and Sarai waiting for this son. Jesus, as we know, is the long-promised Messiah. You know, there's kind of this intertextual period, all, this, all these years, hundreds of years of waiting before the birth of Jesus. Number two, both had a miraculous birth. So uh, Abraham and Sarah, Sarah both laughed because they thought, how can we have a kid, you know, at this age? That was miraculous. And Jesus, of course, was the, uh, the uh, miraculously born child uh, conceived uh, from a virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit, Right? So Jesus is also miraculously born. Number three, both were loved by their fathers. Uh, In our passage here, we saw, take your son, your only son, the one whom whom you love. And uh, when Jesus gets baptized, uh, God's going to kind of open up heaven, and he's going to say, this is my son whom I love, I'm well pleased. Right, so both loved by their fathers. 
Number four, both had a three-day experience. So three days from um, Beersheba to Mount Moriah for Isaac and, and um, uh, Abraham and the servants. And then Jesus, as we know, three days in the tomb before he's raised again. Uh, number five, both carried the wood used in their sacrifice. Did you notice in that story that uh, Abraham puts the, the, the wood for the sacrifice on Isaac's back and he goes up the mountain carrying it himself? And as we know, at least for part of the trip, Jesus is going to carry the cross, uh, his own cross. Um, and number six, both submitted to their father. Both submitted to their father. So it seems like um, there's, some, again, some de- debate about this, but uh, I'm guessing Isaac's around 13-ish or so. And so uh, his dad's 100 and whatever, 13-ish, something like that. And so, you know, it seems like he would be able to, to at least struggle if he wanted to, but we don't have any indication that he did in the text. And then um, Jesus is going to go to the cross and say, uh, nevertheless, not, not my will, but yours be done. And he's going to go in full submission to the Father. Um, like I said, there's a bunch more parallels than that even. I only gave you a taste. I didn't have time to go through all of them. And it's very cool, very interesting, all that kind of stuff. But kind of the question we still get to is like, you know, what, what is the focal point of the, the connection between these two stories? And so I want to spend the rest of our time focusing on one, one connection between both of these passages. And to look at it, the first thing I want us to get in our brains is to try to picture the image of Abraham with the knife above Isaac, who's bound, who's on the wood, and he has the knife. And the question we all, the, the story is begging us to ask is, was he going to go, go through with it? Like, was he really going to do it, or was he not going to do it? And, and the question kind of climaxes at this point of, like, would he do it, yes or no? And that's where we got to wrestle. Like, what, was he ready to do that? And in order to help us interpret that, uh, we actually have a, a really cool way to do that. So we're kind of asking that question. We have a really cool way to do that because the Bible itself, as I've been saying, it's all one big story, and it helps us to interpret other parts of the story. And so we, we come to this super fascinating passage in Hebrews 11. So uh, if you're sticking with Genesis 22, you can. Hebrews 11, uh, I'm going to read a total of three verses starting at 17. So this is basically the author of Hebrews is going to explain what's happening back in Genesis 22. And so that seems like a lot better situation than me, you know, giving just my idea. This is Hebrews telling it. So I'm going to start reading at verse 17. It's just, this is so good. By faith, Abraham, when, tested, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. <clears throat> Notice the use of the word sacrifice there. He who had embraced the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Notice again, only son there. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So the author of Hebrews is asking the same exact question. He's saying, wait a second, he was going to do this even though he knew that God said, through Isaac, that, that's, that's going to be this offspring, this long-promised offspring you're going to get. Okay, so what's it say next? <clears throat> Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Let me read that again. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead... And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. It's, it's right here in the Bible. This isn't just me pointing that out. This is, Hebrews is saying this about the Genesis 22 story. Um, you see, the, the core thing that this passage is getting us is that if God can raise someone from the dead, that makes all the difference. Let me say that again. If God can raise someone from the dead, that makes all the difference in the world. Um, God had been faithful to his word up to this point, and Abraham had trusted all that time through that. And we, Hebrews tells us that Abraham trusted so much that he was faithful, that God, God was going to fulfill his promises, even if that meant he was going to be able to ra- ra- you know, he was gonna have to ra- raise Isaac from the dead. Um, I assume that part of that faith came, remember last week, it's, it's all connected, right? Part of that faith came because Abraham experienced that whole situation with the blood path and the dead, bloody animal pieces and God's presence going through there. So it, it's not like he, you know, 
We can't see it's like a blank slate. It's like God was working through him all these 10 chapters from Genesis 12 the whole way up to Genesis 22. It's a beautiful story the whole way through. Read read the whole thing. It's awesome. Um, But doesn't it sound sort of like what we have the option to do, like you and I? God gives us his word, both the written word of the Bible and also the logos, the, 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 the son, Jesus. And he says, here's my word. Um... I'm calling you to be faithful to my word, and I'm even the kind of God who has the power to raise, and and now you can see that I'm transitioning, raise Jesus Christ from the dead. And that can change, that can make all the difference in the world. That can make all the difference in the world. Um, I'm I'm really into right now, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, there's kind of this really awesome, a whole bunch of stuff that I can't say now about this passage, but I'm really into 1 Corinthians 15, but I just want to read two verses from this. Uh, this is Paul writing, and he says, from, for what I, what I received, in other words, someone said this to me, I'm going to pass on to you as of first importance. So like, this is like one of the main, most important things that I could pass on to you. I received it. I'm passing it on to you. First importance is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now remember, as I always say, when they say in the New Testament, according to the scriptures, they're talking about the Old Testament, right? What we know is the Old Testament. According to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's of first importance. Now, I would say fundamentally, every one of us has one of two basic decisions in life to make. Two basic decisions in life. We can kind of take this one way or the other way, and it makes all the difference in the world. And that is, (laughs) was Jesus Christ raised from the dead, or was he not? If he was not raised from the dead, then I would argue that whatever we're doing that's like seeming religious or seeming spiritual or trying to achieve, you know, right relationship with God by doing good works or, um, you know, maybe we just, you know, like to feel good about ourselves or whatever, all that kind of stuff. I would argue that that's all like, there's not a lot of substance in that. However, if Jesus Christ was raised, was, was resurrected from the dead, then I believe that changes everything else and helps us with every other decision, every other part, every other aspect of our lives entirely outside of just that, that fact. Let me give you a glimpse. This is like a very minute list of all the possibilities, but here's uh, four, four things that I think are true if Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Okay? Uh, number one is you can have a new identity. You can have a new identity. So instead of having your identity based on what you do, your identity is now, Jesus loved me so much that he was able to die for me, and he's so powerful that he can be raised from the dead, and so I have that kind of person who cares that much about me. That's a new identity. You can live out of that instead of living out of, here's how how good I can be in this world. Number two, you can have purpose in life. You can have purpose in life. So as people who are are, um, connected to Jesus we can be involved in the same redemption that he's trying to seek in the whole world. And that gives us, I, mean, I don't care what your job is or what your family situation is or whatever, you can have purpose in trying to bring redemption to the world in the name of Jesus Christ, that same person who was raised from the dead. Number three, we can all get along better. <laughs> Lord, help us all in our world. That could be used a little bit these days. Um, we could all get along better. And that is because we are forgiven... Because Christ's death and resurrection uh, removes, you know, we're, we're forgiven of our sinfulness, we have the freedom and the joy to be able to forgive others. That happens if Jesus is raised from the dead. And lastly, you too can be re- resurrected. You too can be resurrected. And when I say that, I don't just mean after you die, you can have, you know, you, you can still go on living you know, or you can go to heaven, that, those kinds of things. I, I mean that, but I don't just mean that. What I mean is that <clears throat> if Jesus kind of offers this new kind of life, this new way of living life, that all of the areas, remember way back to Genesis uh, 3, when I talked about all the destruction of sin and death and separation that happens as a result of our sinfulness, that if Jesus is re- resurrected, then we have life over all those things, all those different aspects. Now, uh, I want to go back to the lullaby thing. See, the issue is, just like with the story of uh, Abraham and the binding of Isaac, 
We cannot lullaby our sense that we believe that Jesus Christ was resurrected. We can't lullaby it. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, it's unhelpful in our real lives, our actual lives that we live on a day-to-day basis, for us to say, yes, I believe Jesus was resurrected, that's, that's good, uh, in church, and then not have that impact all the rest of our life. Because if, it, if, if it's true, then it changed everything. And so I would always encourage people to investigate it as best you can. Now, are, are any of us going to be able to be 100% conclusive, always, yes, we know for sure this happened, you know, uh, historically we can go back? Maybe not. But the best invest- investigation you can do to become as, as confident as possible in the truth that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And I think there's a whole lot of really, really compelling arguments for why that is absolutely the case. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do today was share with you, if, you, if anyone's not familiar with uh, this, uh, this work uh, called The Case for Christ. So The Case for Christ is, uh, is a book uh, written by this guy named Lee Strobel. And what he did is he was an atheist who was a lawyer and an investigative journalist. His wife became a Christian, and he said to himself, uh, I don't think this Christianity, this is, this is kind of a bunch of crock, right? This, I'm, I'm out. And over time, his wife kind of became more and more compelling. He said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to research this. So he took two years, and he investigated all of the reasons for why or why not Jesus Christ uh, would have been resurrected. That's the only question he focused on. It, was Jesus resurrected, yes or no? He took two years to research it, um, and he wrote a book eventually. It's now a movie as well. Uh, I put some out here on the, on the cart. We had like four copies, but I think they might all be gone already. So uh, if you need to look it up, uh, there's also YouTube videos. So that's free for anybody. Check out a YouTube video about Lee Strobel, Case for Christ. Uh, it's really, really, really compelling information to help us not to lullaby this thing, to help us actually like, become convinced that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead in order that it can change everything in our lives. Um, I began this sermon by just giving stats on, you know, hopelessness and anxiety and depression, and maybe those kind of fall in deaf ears after so many of them or whatever, I'm not sure. But also, as y'all know, you know, the election, COVID, winter, all those kind of things, like those are all realities that we're facing. And the question is, how could we go forward with some amount of hope and with some amount of peace, with some amount of, and I think, I'm, I'm, I'm compelled to say to you that I think the answer has to, to to center or focus in on was Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. Now, Abraham had enough faith to say that whatever he was going to do there with Isaac, he was comfortable, he was confident that God could even raise from the dead. And so the question for us is, like, do we feel the same way about Jesus, yes or no? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a, um, a God who does not um, is, is not just just uh, comfortable with you know seeing death and 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 uh, destruction and separation, but that you sent your Son Jesus Christ to come into this world, to live perfectly where we couldn't, to um, die a death for us, and to show His awesome power through His resurrection. Uh, And I thank you that that reality can change so much of our lives and give us um, identity and hope, uh, purpose, all the things, kind of put together all the pieces of our fragmented and fractured lives uh, through that one central fact. And so I pray that you'd help us to investigate it honestly, to not, um, to to wrestle uh, with those things so that we can see you in the fullness of who you really are. Um, I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.